this video, I'm going to be showing you how to build the best $650 gaming PC build for 2022, featuring a dedicated GPU. Graphics cards are back and so are we. I'm going to run you through all the best components for a build of this budget, cover off how to assemble the system from start right through to finish before looking at the performance of the build a bit later on. In the latest titles like Apex Legends, Fortnite, Halo Infinite, Battlefield, and more. Let's do this. The Cooler Master GM32FQ features a Quad HD panel, 165Hz refresh rate and fast 1ms response time. Plus with support for G-Sync and FreeSync Premium, you're sure to have a tear-free gaming experience. The included IPS panel also looks fantastic, providing deep, rich colours all of the time. Learn more at the links in the description below. As usual, we're going to kick things off by dealing with some of the core components first and doing a bit of a pre-build, putting together as many components outside of the case as possible. This is much easier for a first time builder and also lets us take things nice and slow. In particular, those components today are the motherboard and the processor. And let's look at the CPU first. Intel's latest and greatest Core i3-12100F. Intel are back in a big way with 12th gen and blow AMD's equivalent offerings, frankly, out of the water. This chip features four of Intel's latest performance cores and eight threads, giving us some nice multi-threaded performance for what is undoubtedly a very budget CPU. The chip is also a great pairing for any GPU up to an RTX 3050 or even 3060, allowing for future upgrades. With a low TDP and a great included stock cooler, something which is undoubtedly going to save us a lot of money later on, it ticks all the key boxes. As if that wasn't already good enough, things just keep getting better. The new B660 motherboard chipset, which is what we're opting for today, also supports RAM and CPU overclocking. Intel are truly killing the game right now, and it shows in a really, really big way. In particular, the B660 board we've gone for is this Asus Prime D4 unit. It supports PCIe Generation 4 for our SSDs, allowing us to get future-proofed NVMe speeds. It's got a USB-C header for the latest super-fast USB ports, and of course, four RAM DIMM slots, allowing for dual-channel memory and plenty of upgrades later on. This build is awesome for gaming now at 1080p medium settings, but even better if you wanted to upgrade it later on and having those options is great to see. That's enough of talking about the motherboard and CPU, let's actually put them to action by installing the processor into the board. Now with the latest Intel chips, it's a bit different, so pay attention. You want to pull up the retention arm on your CPU socket, like so, pull the socket cover upwards, nice and easy, and then line your processor up. You'll find a triangle on your processor and a triangle on the socket, and you want these both pointing firmly in the same direction, allowing us to drop the chip into place, give it a bit of a wiggle, to make sure it's seeded and return the cover back down. Unlike the last gen, the black plastic socket cover will pop straight off with basically no hassle and then we can secure the chip down. Lovely stuff. Before we move on to the RAM, which is our next component, we need to cool our CPU down. And for this build, I'm going for the stock cooler, as I alluded to just a few moments ago. Now, of course, an aftermarket air or even liquid cooler would be awesome and it will run quieter than this Intel alternative. But this will keep the chip fairly chilly. You're not gonna have any thermal throttling, which is where a CPU has to slow down because it's running too hot. None of that in this build, and it looks pretty good, giving us more money to spend on other components that will actually improve our gaming performance. The graphics card being a key one of those. This will come with pre-applied thermal paste, so you haven't got to worry about adding your own unless you've used it before, like us. Add this on and then line the cooler up and just push each of the pins in uh, corner by corner. Plug up the fan header and that's basically it as far as the CPU cooler goes. For the memory or the RAM in this build, I've gone for Corsair's Vengeance RGB Pro S L kit. Now you can go for a range of capacities, but I'd recommend two eight gigabyte DIMMs for this build or 16 gigabytes of overall memory. Now, technically the graphics card config we've gone for could manage with just eight gigabytes if you wanted to. But to be honest, it's just not enough in 2022 and we'll create bottlenecks both now 
and when you go to upgrade the system later down the line. This kit will work perfectly and slots into the randoms nice and easily. Apply a nice bit of pressure on each side and it will click into place. Remember, line up the notch on the random with the notch on the dim slot itself. Align the two up and push it down. And that's basically it. Your CPU, RAM, motherboard, cooler, they're all installed. And we can now move on to looking at the case and move in the motherboard assembly into it. And here it is, quite possibly one of the lightest cases to ever grace planet Earth. This is Deepcool's Matrix 40. You can regularly pick this up for like $40 or something ludicrously cheap. Now, when buying a budget case, you need to be careful because there's some really, really rubbish ones out there. Take a look at the one I used for my first build back in 2013. Ouch. Uh, what I mean by that is you want one with a nice bit of mesh paneling at the front for good airflow. You need at least two fans included out of the box. Any less than that is gonna just be a major, major headache. You also want something with decent build quality and good reviews that supports micro ATX motherboards or above. The Matrix 40 ticks all the boxes and we've had some really successful builds in this case in the past. I'd recommend this chassis in a heartbeat for all of those really important reasons. Much like how we'd recommend you proceed with any chassis, you want to start by taking off as many side panels and stuff on the case as possible. That will just make it so much easier to build in, especially for a first time builder, where getting access to all of your parts and components first time makes a massive difference. We're going to lay the case down flat and then grab our motherboard. But before we install this, there's one more important step we really shouldn't forget. And that step can be found inside the motherboard's box, where you'll see we've got one of these, a metal silver plate. This is what's referred to as an IO shield and is essentially a shield between the case and your motherboard's rear IO. We can nice and easily slide this in to the rear of the motherboard tray and click it down corner by corner. Only then can you go ahead and install the motherboard into the case. Make sure that each of the holes through your motherboard has a corresponding standoff in your case. So we've got three at the top, three along the middle and two down the bottom, which seems to align perfectly with the inside of our chassis, making things that bit more simple. Slide the board into place. Hopefully you can see that nice and easily on our fancy overhead camera angle. Slot in those ports through the rear IO. Hold your board into place and screw it down. And that's basically it your motherboard will secure nice and easily. And with those eight screws, it's sure to not want to go anywhere anytime soon. Once the board's in, we can then move on to the storage. And for this build, I've gone for a two and a half inch SSD drive. Seagate's Barracuda Q1 to be precise. Now, when it comes to storage for any build, it's a hard decision. And typically I'd recommend a more expensive NVMe SSD. But for a build like this, saving $30 on storage once again makes a massive difference to your other components. And this drive is still an SSD, so you're still gonna see the speed advantages of solid state over a hard drive. If you take a close look at the drive itself, you'll see you've got these posts on each corner, and these posts actually directly slot through four corresponding holes on the rear panel of the motherboard tray. The drive literally slots into place nice and easily, and we can deal with the wiring and cabling later on, want to go ahead and install the power supply. Now this is another component where picking the right one isn't easy. Technically in a build like this, you could get away with a really cheap 500 watt unit, as long as it had good reviews, a good warranty, and an 80 plus certification. But Cooler Master's MWE 650 Gold will cost you another $20 or so and make a lot more sense. This is because you can actually go ahead and upgrade the PC later down the line. You could add in a more powerful graphics card some more memory or a better CPU. And with the power supply being semi-fanless, it's also gonna be a lot quieter than cheaper units and it's modular, meaning you only plug in the cables you actually need to use, preventing a big rat run of cables lying about your system and making it look a bit of a mess. Inside the included cable bag, you get a wide range of cables and connectors. And I'm gonna talk you through which ones we need to plug in. First and foremost is the CPU power connector. This will of course power up our processor and just slots in to our fully modular interface. You'll also then find yourself having a SATA power connection. This is what we need to add in for our SSD drive and that plugs up to the power supply nice and easily too. Following on from this, you've got the largest cable of the bunch, your motherboard's 24 pin power connection. That's gonna plug up to our modular interface with two parts, a 10 pin and then an 18 pin into the power supply itself. 
Finally, while we're here, we're going to plug up a cable we actually don't need, but it's going to be good for any future upgrades, and that's our PCIe power connector. If you wanted to make cable management easier, you could leave this out, leave it in the box, but I figure having it in the system tucked away makes a lot of sense, and will make upgrading in a few years' time when you can't remember where you put those cables nice and easy. We're then able to plug up the CPU power connection to the top left of the motherboard, motherboard power cable to the far right-hand side, and SATA data and SATA power cables to the SSD, giving them juice and data and then connecting that up to the motherboard, covering off all the power cables we need to install for now. But you're not out of the woods just yet. We also need to plug up the USB ports and power buttons on the top of the chassis. This is nice and quick. We can add in a HD audio cable to the bottom left of the motherboard. This deals with the headphone and mic jack on the IO of your chassis. You've then got USB 3, which goes to the right hand side of our motherboard today, just past our randoms, before finally rounding things off with our JFP1 connectors, powering the power, reset buttons, all that good stuff on the top of the case. These are the fiddliest cables of the bunch, but we'll pop a diagram on your screen now to make it hopefully that little bit easier. With that done, we can finally move on to the component I know most of you have been waiting for, the graphics card. Now, in the current climate, things are actually getting a lot better. I'm sure there are regions in the world where things are still, unfortunately, pretty crap on the GPU front. But in the UK, US, Canada and other locations, things are getting so much better. I appreciate some countries will take longer than others to catch up with GPU supply. But the scalpers have eased off, the miners have left and cards are starting to be more and more available. Cards like this GTX 1650 which you can now commonly find brand new for under $200. Hallelujah. This card's an awesome choice because it gives you 1080p medium settings gaming performance in the latest titles at 60 FPS and above, but is also easily upgradable to a 3050 or 3060. And you're able to sell this in a year or so's time and not really lose any money. Even if you're just looking for a $600 gaming PC to last you for the next, few years, this card will definitely do the job. If it works in the latest titles now, you're sure to be okay in a couple of years' time. It also doesn't require any external power, making the installation process perhaps the easiest of any GPU. Simply push back the clip on your PCIe retention slot, then slide the card into place, applying a bit of pressure, until you hear the click sound. Add a screw in to make sure it doesn't go anywhere, and the card is pretty much done. Our build is actually pretty much done for that matter too. What we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure the performance of this system stacks up as we expect it to in a moment in detailed gaming benchmarks. But first, it's time to see how good the PC looks when it's all turned on in an awesome Gigawatt montage. I'll see you in a second, but first, roll that yeah, montage. powered up, it's now time to make sure the performance stacks up with the aesthetics. And considering how cheap this build is, I think it looks really good. On your screen is a summary of all the games we tested. We try and test 10 to 20 titles for every system we put together, which trust me, takes ages, but it makes sure you guys know exactly how they perform. And hopefully we've covered off a couple of your favourite titles. What we're going to do now is take a closer look title by title, kicking things off with GTA 5. Here we tested out at 1080p normal, sort of medium settings, uh, and use the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. This means you can copy our settings and compare an existing build if you've got one, to make sure this really gives you the performance you deserve. At 1080p medium settings, we pulled in 130 FPS on average. The 90 and 99th percentile metrics indicate how consistent the frame rate was, and we want these to be as close to our average as possible. So a 29 FPS tolerance overall is really not bad and most of the time the frame rate stayed above 112 frames per second. Awesome. Next up we tested out Battlefield 2042, a title where at medium and high settings we had less luck. So we tuned the settings down to low, but even still I think the game looks pretty good. This allowed us to get closer to 70 than 60 frames per second, 67 to be precise, with a 99th percentile result that knocked on the door of that magical 60 number. The game looked pretty good considering it was low settings, and it just shows that the 1650 is really solid, but in some titles you do have to be a bit more realistic uh, with your visual fidelity. COD Vanguard was much the same. We used comparable settings in the latest COD title, and this time pulled in 69 frames per second. 
So slightly more frame rate here. 90 and 99th percentile results were once again a little bit higher too. And the game played pretty well. This is an example of where you do have to be a little bit more open to turn in visual fidelity settings down. But it doesn't mean the gameplay has to look awful by any means. And it's not all bad news. In Forza Horizon 5 at 1080p, we leveraged the high settings preset without an issue. It just shows how game dependent settings are. We got 64 FPS on average, surpassing that magical 60 number. And all importantly, giving us a lot more frame rate at 1080p in a racing title than what we'd get even with next gen consoles. In Halo Infinite Next, we tested once again at 1080p and had to tune those settings down a little bit. We got 67 FPS here, showing just how consistent actually Halo Infinite, COD Vanguard and Battlefield 2042 are when it comes to overall performance metrics. Moving on to Apex Legends, and here once again we tested at 1080p. We managed to pull in this time just shy of 100 FPS, great for you competitive gamers on a budget out there, and it also shows there's maybe legs for medium or even high settings here if you fiddle with the right settings. The game looked good, and to run this first person shooter at nearly 100 FPS is awesome to see. Next up we tried out Valorant. At 1080p high settings this time, we had no issues whatsoever with frame rate. 260 uh, frames to be precise. Uh, average results were pretty good, as were 90 and 99th percentiles, and as always, we used NVIDIA FrameView and MSI Afterburners Revertuner to capture our frame rate results. Finally, to wrap things up, we tested out a bit of Fortnite, this time at 1080p competitive settings. We pulled in 123 FPS on average, with 104 and 90 frames for the 90 and 99th percentile results. One of the things the 1650 struggles with over like the new 3050 is a lack of any DLSS support. DLSS would give us another 20 or 30 frames in all of our titles on average that support the technology. So not having that is a bit of a bummer, but it still shows the 1650 has legs for the latest titles at 1080p 60fps. And that wraps up for this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure you get subscribed. Thanks for watching. And as always, we hopefully will see you in the next one.